<laughs> Welcome back to those of you that are watching with the uh, that are watching on Twitch today. I'm probably just gonna cut that part out. I don't fucking know at this point. Um, <clears throat> welcome, welcome to episode two of the Idiot Book Nook brings you Harry Potter and the Philosopher slash Sorcerer's Stone. We are actually reading from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Um, bit of interesting trivia. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone are the exact same book. One was meant for the English release, one was meant for the American slash Canadian release. Because th the publisher didn't think that American children would understand what a Philosopher's Stone was. Mm -hmm. I mean... They understood the audience! In fairness, how many, how many kids at that point in time knew what the philosopher's stone was actually no that's not wrong i knew what the philosopher's stone was thanks to full metal alchemist see when it comes to that the publisher understood the assignment mm -hmm. <laughs> just gonna throw that out there yep so, for those of you that are new to the podcast, or those of you that might just be tuning into the... Come in! Come in, baby! Come in! Fine, be an asshole. For those of you that are new to the podcast, or might just be tuning into the Twitch... The objective of this podcast is to read a chapter of Harry Potter and then have an in-depth discussion about it. We may not interact with the audience live on Twitch during the reading, but we will try and bring the audience into the discussion once we finish reading our chapter. The whole point of this is to practice our voice acting and to get more comfortable with that because we all have aspirations of being actors or voice actors or at least expanding that area of our abilities. I got you. For those of you that are listening to the podcast, we had a cat on camera here, so uh, if you would like to tune in to watch the podcast live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash blazewing2010 is where we are currently being hosted, and these will also be uploaded to the Crimson Entertainment YouTube channel as well. The podcast will be out. We are aiming for a release every Monday, and uh, depending on how fast we take these chapters, determine how many episodes we get through in a streaming session. <clears throat> um, since we're essentially starting this episode off brand new, I'm Blazewing. Um, I enjoy fantasy and sci-fi books, and I am a bit of a jack-of-all-trades and a bit of a nerd, an all-around nerd. And I am the Reading Dragon. I, too, like fantasy and sci-fi novels, and I am very much into crafting and making things out of what I have uh, and doing the whole slightly jack of all trades thing except in the crafting field um, and I am wanting to get back into narration and this has been one of the ways that I've been doing that so yeah I'm Lady Punnett I actually hate fantasy I don't see why I'm even here right now <laughs> I it's not like I have a TikTok that's full of fantasy and high fantasy characters. Liar. Yeah. Lies! You tell them! Yeah, okay, yeah, that's fair. My whole dream is to have a cottage core themed apartment. Oh. But it's a, it's a dream. It's a dream that's on hold right now because... Money. Money. And I live in a one-bedroom apartment. But that is a goal to have, like, a cottage core theme somewhere with, down with the all line of the, with all of the plants with all of the plants and the cats and just like something to for me to practice my craft because i am a practice i do practice magic myself but any who's it i'm also a seamstress i make my own costumes as well as hats and plush toys and dresses and all the like i uh love art of all kinds and video games Speaking of dreams, that's mm -hmm. actually something we should, that's actually something I kind of want to bring up. Uh, all right, Jordan, we will see you soon. Thank you for joining us. Leave us, on a, lurk. Leave us a lurk if you want. Um, dreams. Yeah. Um, so we're all nerds. We are all very much, Harry Potter influenced us 
each one of us in different ways and eventually led to us meeting one another. Um, but as for dreams, like Lady Punnett had mentioned with the, uh, the cottage core stuff, my dream is to have, so I, I'm a journalist by, by trade. It's what I've been training the last five years in college, sorry, in university to do. My dream is to have a mobile filming studio. I want to do travel journalism. I want to travel around the world or specifically around North America ish, uh, if I can. And I want to highlight different areas, different things. And I want to have a mobile filming studio. So that is one of my goals at some point. I want to take a van and I want to convert it into a living space slash filming studio so I can literally just travel around and have my office right there. How about mm -hmm. you, Reading Dragon? What are your goals? Um, I would actually like a bigger place to live instead of this dinky little two-bedroom apartment that's uh, slowly falling apart. Um, <laughs> but I would like to have enough space in my home to have a recording, uh, recording studio or at least a big enough to where I can have film recording and audio recording as well as a... Uh, editorial space so like a spot where i can um have my computer set up and edit everything that i make and um also be able to have space to do like crafting projects and whatnot um and also just be able to do the things i love as a form of income because while i do generally work uh, a, a a nine to five even though it's later in the day it, it doesn't really bring me that much joy and happiness but it is a form of income that is needed mm. and i would eventually like to have other forms of income coming in so that way i can uh try to live as comfortably as i can <laughs> And also be able to travel to the places I want to go to because I actually have family in Canada. And then I have all you guys that I am friends with and are my, my found family in Canada. That's apparently where a lot of my loved ones are at. And also on the East Coast, uh, especially with uh, the friends that I have made through the Total Party Knockouts Dungeons & Dragons podcast on YouTube so yeah, yeah I was gonna say at this point I've been you and I've gotten to know each other pretty good we there was a point where we were in voice chat together almost every night at this point you are considered family so <laughs> <clears throat> um, you are you are effectively a sibling let's just let's just yeah. put that there in fact I ha I apparently have a lot of family members over where you're at Blazewing <laughs> I love it yeah well especially since my grandmother is originally from Alberta yeah, and you and I have talked about that actually a fair bit. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get right down into the city where I'm at. But yes, I am actually in Western Canada. Uh, we're not all based in Western Canada, and I'm not going to divulge where everybody is. But I am actually from Western Canada, originally from Eastern Canada. So if you know me IRL, you kind of know my story. You know where I'm from, that sort of thing. But yep. <clears throat> let's rein this back in a little bit. And um, I think we should delve into our next chapter i'm really enjoying these discussions and we were actually talking um kind of so for those of you that are watching the stream we were talking while we were on break for those of you that are listening to the podcast we had a 15 Last. minute break that lasted like an entire week for you guys so sometime during that week we were talking slowly uh, very slowly mm -hmm. about um the fact that reading the story for you guys live on twitch and for the podcast is bringing kind of a new perspective for us almost um we're getting to almost relive it again like when you first go through the harry potter story there's that initial sense of wonder and enjoyment and magic in the air but every time that first experience can only come once it, it only mm -hmm. happens that first time but for us having read this like countless times and now narrating it for you guys it's bringing almost that sense of first time wonderment back at least for me it's just it's bringing in that first time along with uh, new perspectives yeah. especially since we're reading it in a time where a lot of the material in this book series is now considered dated yes 
especially for the time that it was written yes. and especially for the fact that nowadays especially with some of the things that have come out of the original author of this series uh, we do not condone yeah this person's uh opinions or views this is so our podcast and our stream and our youtube is a safe place for trans and um gender non-conforming individuals please don't think that it's not we try very hard to have a respectful space for all people we do not condone some of the we do not condone a lot of the views of the author we do not condone kind of the atmosphere that she brings we have been trying to separate the author from the work and we have been trying to hold on to something that for us had a significant impact on who we are as a person on who we are as people mm -hmm. um that being said there are some things within this series that are pro highly problematic and we do acknowledge that um so we just want you to know going forward that as problematic as some of these things are we do not condone them nope i, I want to be 100 percent specifically i, I just want to be extremely explicitly clear about that right off the bat mm -hmm. anything else you two want to add Meh. Meh. i mean this pod i mean this podcast by itself consists of uh those of us that are gender non-conforming so me um so i am actually non-binary uh, i am a uh, trans femme non-binary individual um, and i still as much as it has issues there are still parts of harry potter that i embrace because hogwarts was home for me during a fairly rough point in my life as we discussed mm. last episode mm -hmm. lady punnage aren't you also gender non-conforming as well um, female but i don't really care about pronouns too much i just use she her because those are the ones i've always used but there are days where I'm like, I don't feel like this. Yeah. I don't feel like being female. I feel like being a blob. And on those days, I wear like my big sweaters and my, my loose pants and just hair and a ponytail. Just like, nah. But in mm -hmm. general, I think the closest thing would be I'm uh, she, her pronouns usually, but if you want to use they, them, I don't care. So mm -hmm. that actually brings up a good point. Uh, first, I just want to comment that mo a lot of there are a lot of days I just want to be a blob too, but uh, that's beside the point. Let's go over some, let's go over an interesting point. Um, my pronouns are actually she slash they. Mm -hmm. I, I also go by she slash her uh, and... Other than that, there are days where I feel more masculine than feminine, and then other days where I feel more hyper-feminine than uh, any day. And then there are days where I'm just like, today's agenda is bleh! So I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, add that to our introduction. Give me one second. Okay. And uh, Lady Punnett, did you just want to rehash for us? Oh, um, I, I, I'm not real. I don't care about gender too much. However, I do go by she, her pronouns most usually. There are days though where I don't feel female. I feel more like a blob. So mm -hmm. it's, I usually use she, her. If you want to use they, them with me, I'm fine with it too. I'll be more likely to use, respond to she, her though, since it's what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I don't care about gender. Gender's weird. Mm -hmm. I am very femme person, but gender is weird. Gender is a weird concept. I totally get that. It is one of the weirder social concept. So, as you can see, we're a very diverse group of, or we're a very diverse trio here. Um, we all have play, we all have the our own places where we come from. Everybody's got their issues. Everybody's got their thing. That sort of thing. So, with that being said, I believe we have chapter two to get through. Yes, we do. <clears throat> Welcome to Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Slash Sorcerer's Stone, narrated by the Reading Dragon, Blazewing, and Lady Punnett. Chapter 2. The Vanishing Glass Nearly ten years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step, but Privet Drive 
had hardly changed at all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursley's front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bonnets. But Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby, and now the photographs showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a carousel at, a fair, at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign of at all that another boy lived in the house too yet harry potter was still there asleep at the moment but not for long his aunt petunia was awake and it was in her shrill voice that made the first noise of the day ow sorry try that again you cut out up get up now harry woke with a start his aunt rapped at the door again. Up! She screeched. Harry heard her walking toward the kitchen and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the stove. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorcycle in it. He had a funny feeling he'd had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? Ne she demanded. Nearly. Said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon. And don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect on my Dudley... On my Duddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing. Nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed, and after pulling a spider out of one of them, he put them on. Harry was used to spiders, because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them, and that was where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all Dudley's birthday presents— it looked as though Dudley had gotten the new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise, unless, of course, it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favorite punching bag was Harry, but he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was, because all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobbly knees, black hair, and bright green eyes, he wore round glasses held together with a lot of scotch tape because of all the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead that was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had had it as long as he could remember, and the first question he could ever remember asking his aunt, Petunia, was how he had gotten it. In the car crash that, sorry, in the car crash when your parents died. She had said. And don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Come your hair. He barked by way of a morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together. But it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way, 
all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of egg and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. His face fell. Thirty-six, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Auntie Marge's presents, see? It's here under the this big one from Mommy and Daddy. All right. Thirty-seven, then, said Dudley, going red in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously scented, da scented danger, too, because she said quickly, And, oh, and, we'll, sorry, and we'll buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents, is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, So I'll have thirty... thirty... Thirty-nine, sweetum, said Aunt Petunia. Oh. Dudley sat, Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's worth, just like his father. Attaboy, Dudley! He ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang and Aunt Petunia went to answer it while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike and video camera and remote control airplane, 16 new computer games, and a VCR. He was ripping the paper off a gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Mrs. Figg's broke Mrs. Figg's broken her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger restaurants, or the movies. Every year, Harry's, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig, a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs. Fig made him look at photographs of all the cats she ever owned. Now what? said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry as though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fig had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibbles, Snowy, Mr. Paws, and Tufty again. We could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there. Or rather, as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them, like a slug. What about... Uh, what's her name? Your friend, uh, Yvonne? On vacation in... Ma Majorca. 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 On vacation in Majorca. Not Aunt Petonia. You could just leave me here. Harry put in hopefully. He'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change and maybe even have a go on Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though he'd just swallowed a lemon. Or, ugh, sorry, let me read that again. Aunt Petunia looked as though she had just swallowed a lemon. And come back and find the house in ruin? She snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry but they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia slowly. And leave him in the car, 
That car is new. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he'd really cried. But he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinky, Daddy Dumbs, don't cry. Mommy won't let him spoil your special day. She cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want him t t to come. Dudley yelled between huge pretend sobs. He always sp spoils everything. He shot Harry a nasty grin through the gape. Um, he shot Harry a nasty grin through the gap in his mother's arms. Just then, the doorbell rang. Oh dear Lord, they're here," said Aunt Petunia frantically. And a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Pierce Polkis walked in with his mother. Pierce was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was actually the one who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Pierce and Dudley. On the way to the zoo for the first time in his life, his aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they'd left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he had said, putting his large purple face right up close to Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy. Any funny business, any at all, and you'll be in that cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry, honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just no good telling the Dursleys he didn't make them happen. Once, Aunt Petunia, try, mm, tired of Harry coming back from the barbers looking as though he hadn't been at all, had taken a pair of kitchen scissors to cut his hair so short he was almost bald except for his bangs, which she left to hide that horrible scar. Dudley had laughed himself silly at Harry, who spent a sleepless night imagining school the next day, where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and taped glasses. Next morning, however, he had gotten up to find his hair exactly as it had been before Aunt Petunia had sheared it off. He had been given a week in his cupboard for this, even though he had tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old sweater of Dudley's, brown with orange puffballs. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fitted a hand puppet, but certainly wouldn't fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash, and, to his great relief, Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he'd gotten into terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school kitchens. Dudley's gang had been chasing him, as usual, when, as much to Harry's surprise as anyone else's, there he was, sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress, telling them Harry had been climbing school buildings. But all he tried to do, as he shouted at uncle vernon through the locked door of his cupboard was jump behind a big trash mm, was jump behind the big trash cans outside the kitchen doors harry supposed that the wind must have caught him in mid jump but today nothing was going to go wrong it was even worth being with dudley and pierce to be spending the day somewhere that wasn't school his cupboard or mrs fig's or mrs fig's cabbage smelling living room while he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt. Mm. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things: people at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the bank, and Harry were just a few of his favorite subjects. This morning, it was motorcycles. Roaring along like maniacs, the young hoodlums, he said as the motorcycle overtook them. I had a dream about a motorcycle. 
said Harry, remembering suddenly. It was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the car in front. He turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face like a gigantic beet with a mustache. Motorcycles don't fly! Dudley and Pierce sniggered. I know... Oh, sorry. sorry. I know they don't. Said Harry. It was only a dream. But he wished he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing the Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions, it was his talking about anything acting in a way it shouldn't. No matter if it was in a dream or even a cartoon, they seemed to think he might get dangerous ideas. It was a very sunny Saturday and it was a very sunny Saturday, and the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys bought Dudley and Pierce large chocolate ice creams at the entrance, and then, because the still smiling, mm, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they bought him a cheap lemon ice pop. It wasn't bad either, Harry thought, licking it as they watched a gorilla scratching its head, who looked remarkably like Dudley, except that it wasn't blonde. Harry had the best morning he had in a while. He was careful to walk a little way. Mm. He was careful to walk a little way apart from the Dursleys, so that Dudley and Pierce, who were starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back on their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the zoo restaurant, and when Dudley had a tantrum because his knickerbocker glory didn't have enough ice cream on top. Uncle Vernon bought him another one, and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry felt, afterward, that he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they went to the reptile house. It was cool and dark in there, with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Pierce wanted to see huge, poisonous cobras and thick, man-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the largest snake in the place. It could have wrapped its body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crushed it into a trash can. But, at the moment, it didn't look in the mood. In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed against the glass, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move! He whined at his father. Uncle Vernon tapped on the glass, but the snake, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again! Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. This is boring. Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom itself. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers on the glass, trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard as a bedroom, where the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least he got to visit the rest of the house. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes. Slowly, very slowly, it raised its head until its eyes were on a level with Harry's. It winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly around to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked too. The snake jerked its head toward Uncle Vernon and Dudley, then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I get that all the time. I know. Harry murmured through the glass, though he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. Where do you come from, anyway? Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail at a little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. Boa Constrictor, Brazil. Was it nice there? 
The boa constrictor jabbed its tail at the sign again, and Harry read on. This specimen was bred in the zoo. Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil. As the snake shook its head, a deafening shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley! Mr. Dursley, come and look at the snake! You won't believe what it's doing! Dudley came waddling toward them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you! He said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell hard on the concrete floor. What came next happened so fast no one saw how it happened. One second, Pierce and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had leapt back with howls of horror. Harry sat up and gasped. The glass in front of the boa constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and stared, running for the exits. Oh, sorry. People throughout the reptile house screamed and started running for the exits. As the snake slid swiftly past him, Harry could have sworn a low, hissing noise said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. The keeper of the reptile house was in shock. But the glass... He kept saying, Where did the glass go? The zoo director made... Mm, the do... Mm, bleh. <laughs> English. <laughs> English is a thing. The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong, sweet tea while he apologized over and over again. Pierce and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything except snap playfully at their heels as it passed. But by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was telling them how it had nearly bitten off his leg, while Pierce was swearing it had tried to squeeze him to death. But worst of all, for Harry at least, was Pierce calming down enough to say, Harry was talking to it, weren't you, Harry? Uncle Vernon waited until Pierce was safely out of the house before talk. Uncle Vernon waited until Pierce was safely out of the house before starting on Harry. He was so angry he could hardly speak. He managed to say, Go cover state no meals! Before he collapsed into a chair, and Aunt Petunia had to run and get him a large brandy. Harry lay in his dark cupboard much later, wishing he had a watch. He didn't know what time it was, and he, he couldn't be sure the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't risk sneaking to the kitchen for some food. He'd lived with the Dursleys almost ten years. Ten miserable years, as long as he could remember. Ever since he'd been a baby and his parents had died in that car crash. He couldn't remember being in the car when his parents had died. Sometimes, when he strained his memory during long hours in the cupboard, he came up with strange... He came up with a strange vision. A blinding flash of green light and a burn. A blinding flash of a green light and a burning pain on his forehead. This, he supposed, was the crash. Though he couldn't imagine where all the green light came from, he couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt and uncle never spoke about them, and of course he was forbidden to ask questions. There were no photographs of them in the house. When he had been younger, Harry had dreamed and dreamed of some unknown relation coming to take him away, but it had never happened. The Dursleys were his only family. Yet sometimes he thought, or maybe hoped, that strangers in the street seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were, too. A tiny man in a violet top that had bowed to him once while out shopping with Aunt Petunia and Dudley. After asking Harry furiously if he knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed them out of the shop without buying anything. 
A wild-looking old woman dressed all in green had waved merrily at him once on a bus. A bald man in a very long purple coat had actually shaken his hand in the street the other day and then walked away without a word. The weirdest thing about all these people was the way they seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get a closer look. At school, Harry had no one. Everybody knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy old clothes and broken glasses, and no one liked to disagree with Dudley's gang. And thus ends chapter two. So, I got a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. First... I hate Vernon. And second, you do a really good snake. Thank you. I am lizard. So, um, Lady Punnett, this was kind mm -hmm. of a uh, speech. Uh, this was kind of a, uh, a speech light or line light chapter for you. Yes. Um, do you, let's start with you since you haven't had a chance to really talk or to voice things. What are your thoughts on this chapter? Rereading the chapter, I realize you can infer a lot more with Petunia's character than you could mm -hmm. before. Like, so for example... Now, once again, this is going more into theory, maybe stretching a bit. She doesn't have Dudley help cook at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. We know this. Mm -hmm. So from a young age, she has taught Harry how to cook. Yes. Because she knows that soon, even though she doesn't want to admit it, she doesn't want magic, that soon Harry will be on his own. Yes. Yep. She doesn't know of Hogwarts. Well, she probably does know that Hogwarts will provide food for him, but she knows that once he becomes of age, he won't want to be with them. So mm -hmm. she's been teaching him how to cook mm -hmm. at a young age. I actually like that take, and I just want to kind of add on to that. Um, I think that in her own way, despite the fact that we can't see it here. And it's not explicitly stated here. There are certain things that we can see within this chapter that show that as much as she despises him and she doesn't want to admit that he is family and she doesn't want to admit that she cares for him, in her own way, she does because he is still family. She teaches him how mm -hmm. to cook. She is teaching him survival skills the only way that she can without giving too much up. She knows that at some point, yes, Harry and Dudley are going to be on their own. Dudley is a spoiled brat, and I think she knows that. I don't mm -hmm. think I don't think she knows how to correct that. But she also understands that they're well off as uh, as a family. They they have a decent house. They've mm -hmm. got a fairly large house with a lot of knickknacks here and there. They can obviously afford to get Dudley whatever he wants for his birthday, like the fucking excuse my language thirty seven. Uh, presents. Nine. Sorry, 39 presents sitting on the table. Sorry, 37 presents sitting on the table, but by the end of the day, 39. I, I think she understands that Dudley will be able to afford things for himself, that he will be able mm -hmm. to maybe hire somebody to do these things for him because they are in, they are that type of family. They're like upper middle class slash lower rich class family-ish. Mm-hmm. But when Harry is out on his own, I absolutely 100% agree that there are going to be things that he needs to survive. And I think that in her own way, she is teaching him the survival skills that he needs. Like, this is how you cook. This is how you clean. We get into it in a later chapter where she's showing him how to do laundry. Unless she was also possibly training him as a as a possible future uh, housekeeper to Dudley. Ew. I don't think she would go that far because... Bearing in mind, during this time, it was expected of young boys to go live on their own, not yeah. with family. Uh, Jordan the Dude has popped up in the chat and said, perhaps she wants to help him as a way to make up for the connection that she never had with her sister. And I think that's actually a fairly good point to make and fairly observant. Mm -hmm. There may be a part of Petunia that, you know, she's set in her ways and she's steadfast and she has to keep up appearances because of who she is, who she's married and the type of lifestyle that she's gotten into now there may be a part of her that regrets not having that relationship with her sister. And I think that Jordan raises a very good point. This might be her way of now that her sister is effectively dead of trying to make mm -hmm. up for that and trying to at least get somewhat of a connection, even if it's not that obvious, even though it's a very twisted way of yes. doing that. I would and... also, Oh, sorry. Go oh. ahead. 
And also, um, unfortunately, it is still very volatile, a very volatile household. Yes. And a very toxic household to Harry. Yes. An- another point I like to point out is um, Harry, w- during the beginning of the chapter, Harry was like, oh, I can just stay here by myself. And Petunia looked at him and said, and have a house come to ruin. Yes, we. Th- he says, I'm not going to blow anything up. But I think part of her is worried that if something were to happen, like Petunia is a cautious person. She's mm-hmm. suspicious of everyone. I think mm-hmm. she would think that if something terrible happened, like he tries to make himself some food or God forbid someone tries to break in. I think she's worried that the accidental magic would cause damage to the house and him. Also, I think it's because she doesn't want him to be alone because Mm -hmm. she's like, no, but I think she makes it worse because of Vernon. I think Mm -hmm. she's trying to show she's a part of his team and that's why she's harder on him. And it makes me wonder if Vernon wasn't in the picture would she still be as hard on Harry? I agree that, with that. That's kind of why I brought up the uh, fan fiction that Blaze Wayne and I were talking about er- earlier if um, the of the alternate universe where Petunia actually had gotten what she wanted out of her sister. Um, because, uh, again, in that universe, she did not marry the into the Dursley family. She married into a different family. And she was actually a lot kinder to to harry and so was her husband in fact uh harry had a much better upbringing in that um universe he even had his own uh larger bedroom larger than what he had in the dursley household with like his own books his own study and whatnot again he was raised more as a scientifically analytical child because of the family that she ended up marrying into I think that Petunia recognized that as much as she despised who Harry was and what he stood for and what he represented, that she still understood that he was family and in some respect she still had to take care of him and she had that obligation because he is family. That being said, don't mistake that for me saying that just because you are related to somebody by blood that that automatically makes you family. Again, it brings me back to the point of... I think she's doing the best that she can in the situation and the life that she's built for herself. I think, I I think she's effectively trapped herself in this case and she doesn't know how to, she doesn't know how to ask for help. She doesn't know how to rescue herself from that situation. And I think that this reflects very much on the fact that yes, it's twisted, but again, she is actually looking after Harry and, actually teaching him things which is more than you'd expect from a a house that's painted in this a a household that's painted in this type of light and this type of narcissism and this type of uh, abusive relationship and they could have just as easily dropped harry off to um is it still an orphanage or like some sort of child protective services They cho- yeah. they chose to keep him, which is also a very good point. They could have absolutely dropped him off somewhere or left him with somebody else or just chosen to not take him in and let him freeze, which is a devastating thought to think of. They chose to take him in and raise him. Mm-hmm. It might have had something to do with the letter that Dumbledore left behind. However, um, it also, um, w- with the part of her saying and have the house come to ruin... I agree with Lady Punnett's theory on that. I also want to bring up what if uh, Petunia actually knew more as to what happened with the Potters than she was letting on. Because in the in the first chapter, Hagrid did say that the house was practically broken down and destroyed. Yeah. And he had to rescue Harry from the rubble. So what if Anne Petunia actually knew bits and pieces of what actually happened lady punna you're freaking out what is going on i have petunia was petunia was lily's last living relative Mm -hmm. yep that means she was in charge of all the estate left behind that means she would have had to go see all the estate and oversee things with she would have had to spoken with a lawyer because even though harry was next of kin she would have had to be the regent for that so she would have had to go to godric's hollow and check Mm -hmm. the property Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, because we still have that divide between the muggle world and the wizarding world. There may be different rules for the wizarding world in that respect, especially when it comes to muggles and considering that 
uh, that Petunia is a muggle, effectively. It may have gone to, say, Dumbledore, because Dumbledore, it, it, it is brought up later on that Dumbledore knew them. Um, and as Don't... far as... Pardon? Sorry, yeah. I have with Dumbledore as the magical guardian. I will come to that when we right. find out about that later. And there are yeah. actually... There are actually points when it comes to Godric's Hollow that I really, really want to dig into. But unfortunately, we are not going to get to those until book seven, which is way down the line. Um, I really want to start digging into some of the meteor lore, but we're only in the beginning here. So I don't want to delve too far into that. I will say, though, um, for those that are already familiar with the book series, uh, Godric's Hollow was actually a mixed community of both muggles and magic users. That is fair. I think it was one of the only communities that was actually mixed, was it not? I believe it was so. A community known to have both magical and non-magical people. I'm going to do um, a quick search. Give me one second. I'll come back with some more. You two talk. All right, so next point I would like to bring up. Um, in this chapter, it shows that uh, Vernon takes really, leans really far into the whole uh, authoritative role. And he's the one that usually delves out the punishment. Yes, Petunia, mm -hmm. like, sent him to the cupboard for a week. I think Harry might be, I'm not saying Harry exaggerated that, because we know he had to go to the bathroom, and unless it was in the summer, he went to school and stuff. Mm -hmm. But Petunia typically doesn't deal out punishment. Yes, she's like, really hard on him and stuff but we don't i don't recall in the books we ever see her do anything aside from screeching at him and making demands not saying that's an excuse not saying that's not abuse but like she has to my remembrance never physically laid a hand on harry she was the verbal and emotional abuser while mr while vernon was the physical abuser i would like to bring up another theory i have about that mm -hmm. Petunia knows, although she, oh, we see how far they go to try and stop it. She knows that her nephew, that Harry, is going to go to Hogwarts. I think the reason she was so hard on him and did the emotional abuse was she didn't want to get attached. I just want to pause here for a quick sec. Critter Shy, you are late, but welcome on in. It is never too late to hop on in. We are only on chapter two of uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher slash Sorcerer's Stone. We're in the discussion portion, and we are uh, framing these as podcast episodes. So, you know, just kind of stick around, and you'll get the hang of things. Ooh. Uh, Jordan the Dude says, Staying face. A divided home is more scandalous. And Critter Shy says, She hits him with a frying pan, I believe. That's in the second book. And we're not going to get to that until the uh, second book. We'll deal with that when it comes up. Yep. Again, with the discussion portion, like we might not interact with you guys while we're reading, but the discussion portion, we absolutely want to bring our audience into the discussion and address the points that you guys bring up live in the chat on Twitch. Heck yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Don't apologize. Uh, so, Godric's Hollow. So, just, so, so, go ahead. Mm. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. You do Godric's Hollow, because I'm about to go into, like, things I would change. Okay. So, you go, go with Godric's Hollow first. Godric's Hollow, so, just a bit of lore. Uh, I've got it here. I'm actually getting this from the harrypotter.fandom.com. Uh, so, again, this is the Harry Potter wiki. They do, they do a lot of research before they put, sh before they put shit up, because they have to, and they try to make sure that their information is accurate as possible to lore and they do a lot of digging so this is where some of my information is going to be coming from it is going to be one of my primary sources because they are one of the experts on the subject godrick's hollow was a village in the west country of england it was a small community which centered on a village square with only a church a post office a pub and a few retail shops the residential streets were lined with quaint cottages and there was an area called church lane that led up to the church it was inhabited by a number of notable wizarding families. The Dumbledore family and Bethilda Bagshot both resided in the village, which, again, are names that come up throughout the series. And it was perhaps the most famous is where Harry Potter and his parents lived when he was a baby and where they were murdered. And Lord Voldemort met his first downfall. Thus, the village was notable as the place where Harry Potter became known as the boy who lived. Despite this, Harry did not revisit the village until Christmas of 1997, which is unfortunately, again, the seventh book. And we will eventually get there. According to Maybe. it, may, if we live, if we live, according to a history of magic, the graveyard was rumored to be haunted. And at the time it was forbidden to, par uh, to park in Godric's hollow between 1st of May to 30th of September. And as for looking through to see if it was a muggle and wizarding village, I'm pretty sure it was, but there's no information on this document about that. Huh? 
Well, because it was mentioned in the first in the first chapter that uh, ha Hagrid did mention that he was able to get Harry out of the house um, that the Potters were killed in before the Muggles could actually gather around and gawk. Uh, a sign was graffitied over the years with names and messages of support for Harry, something that he uh, thought was touching when he visited. The house, like the, uh, like the, stat uh, the statue, had been made invisible to muggles. Um, like I said, I'm scanning through this, but I don't actually see any... Oh, hold on. Godric's Hollow was one of the places where magical families had come to live alongside muggles. Here we go. Over the centuries, it was home to many wizards and witches of note, including Godric Gryffindor, who was born there, and Bowman Wright, who forged the first golden snitch in the Middle Ages. Others who called the village home were Dumbledore's family, the family of James and Lily Potter, Bethilde Bagshot, Ignotus Peveril, pure-blood ancestor of Harry Potter, was born and subsequently buried at Godric's Hollow. So yes, it was actually a village of muggles and wizards. And seemed like it was a uh, um, hometown for the Potters, Harry's father's side of the family. Harry's family is actually fairly well tied and established. He has some fairly famous uh, relatives that lived in Godric's Hollow. Anyways, I think Lady Punnett had some things she Another wanted to address point, and she's going Harry. nuts. Harry is technically a lord. Oh shit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're he not wrong. He has a title. He is literally Lord Potter, but it's never brought up and Dumbledore has all of the connections and he's the one that's in charge of his estates and in charge of his banks and in charge of everything and he can't touch it until he's 17 years old and he's never made aware of it until well after he is 17 years old even though he should have been going to finishing classes so he could actually be a lord holy shit <laughs> holy fuck and technically speaking when he was in his fourth year when he was put into the goblet of fire he should have been emancipated because he would have been considered an adult because only adults were allowed to participate in the goblet of fire yeah Holy I'm, so, I'm very passionate about that oh, you're good it yeah this is me off you're good from from our chat critter shy says i've had this rant myself several times yup um there's a lot of lore and a lot of background information that we don't actually get to in the series and that we don't actually see in the series. People have like people have spent so the Harry Potter books came out in the nineties and they continue to persist into the two thousands and then of course the movies came out. People have spent time since then until now, which is twenty, thirty years, digging into the lore on this and getting down to the nitty gritty. So a lot of the research on this is already done. Like a good chunk of the research on this is already done, but one of the things I love about the Harry Potter series is that you always learn something mm -hmm. every time you every time you go through it. Yep. Do we have anything else to add for chapter two? Um, can we go into the bit of things we would change? Because I would like to point out a glaring uh, thing that yep. just hurt the Dursleys more than helped. Yep. Just yes. give me one second. Critter says, how about the fact that he didn't have a birth certificate, so technically he wouldn't have been able to go to school? I believe that comes up in the next chapter. They they have a brief mention of school, but it comes up, I think, in mm -hmm. chapter uh, chapter three or chapter four. Technically speaking, yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So the Dursleys are all about looking normal, perceiving being normal. Everything's okay. Not a speck of magic about them. Harry has his oddities, yes, but besides that, he appears to be a normal kid. Except for the fact that a well-off family that is able to purchase all these gifts gives their nephew secondhand clothing, and there's no pictures of him. And it's well known in the neighborhood there's two kids living there. Mm -hmm. We also come to the realization that they don't want to admit that he exists. They would mm -hmm. rather shove... They. they they would rather he take the approach of kids should be seen and not heard, but in his case, they would rather he not be seen as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, but here's the thing, though. They want to be perceived as normal. Back in the 90s, it was very common for housewives to come over to one another's houses and shoot the shit and drink the tea and spill it, too. But imagine you're a housewife and you go to the dead Dursleys and you see all these pictures of... Their son, but not their nephew. And you ask, oh, well, does Harry just not like getting his picture taken? Oh, he doesn't? Okay. Uh, where are his toys then? I see Dudley's always playing and stuff. 
Oh, that's sorry to hear that. What about his... And then you walk in and you see his hair. Harry go into the cupboard under the stairs. Mm-hmm. Or he's probably not allowed to go into the cupboard when company is over. Unfortunately, I don't think we have enough information on which to uh, make a an educated guess on that. I think it might actually be mentioned in the books. Critter brings up an interesting point, though. Uh, I believe that they I believe they use the excuse for his clothes and treatment as uh, ha as the fact that he's a problem child. Mm hmm. Yeah, I believe um, if I remember correct. Well, you will come across it in the books if it's in there that uh, the Dursleys explain not only that he was a problem child, but um, that they they basically made up a bunch of things about Harry and his parents that uh, as a way to try to explain why Harry is the way he is and why they treat him the way that he that he is being treated. Which is why one of the things I would change is, yes, he's a problem child. You would still have at least his school pictures on the wall. Here's the, here's, here's what I know I'm digging in deep on this, but it's just, I, I hate it. I hate that Harry's in this place. I hate Dumbledore didn't take him out of an abusive household. I don't care about the whole, oh, the blood protects the blood. No, he was in an abusive household for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Give me some redemption with at least Petunia, who has like a small picture of him on the mantle of one Christmas. Or or better yet, they find smaller clothes from him at a secondhand store and there's some holes in them, but it's the best they can do because they know he's just going to make them more holy. Or here's another thing. They didn't ask Marge to help because Petunia didn't say she'd say no. She said, you know, she hates the boy because she doesn't want Harry to go to someone she knows doesn't like him. Mm -hmm. Jordan, the dude says, it sounds like a 1950s environment. Yeah. And during the time that the stories do take place, a lot of the 1950s mindset is still pretty hard set in a lot of families and communities. So we have to take in mind that during the time that this story takes place, it, it, it was a little bit, it, it's unfortunately a little bit more common than people want to believe no matter how much we want to like go in and change it. But unfortunately, a lot of households did practice those things that the Dursleys were actively practicing. Which is also, uh, sorry, go ahead. All I'm asking is for like silent, silent ally Aunt Petunia, who doesn't actually hit him or hit him with frying pans. And when he's sent to the cupboard without supper, Harry will open the door like past midnight and see a small plate of like a peanut butter sandwich and some milk and a note that just says, put clean the plates before you go to bed or just tiny things like that. Have him have one ally in that house so he knows Yes, my family doesn't treat me nicely, but at least I know my aunt tries her best. Maybe Vernon's also abusive to her if she starts to disagree for going with the 1950s mindset. Bear in mind that that was very common. Maybe that's, that's why Petunia can't disagree with him. That's actually a fairly good point. Uh, Critter mm -hmm. Shy also says Petunia did grow up in that time, so it does make sense. And I mean, mm -hmm. you're not wrong there. These are all very good points. Mm hmm I actually prefer that. Have her be afraid of her husband. Her husband's known to be big. If he's not afraid to hit a child in front of her, maybe she's afraid he'll turn on her if she disagrees. Have her be a silent ally at night, but during the day when Vernon's there, she's on board. She's forcing the boy to cook and clean and do all this stuff, but really she's helping him become an independent adult. And maybe, just maybe, Harry sometimes finds like secondhand books in the cupboard or the one time he finds like a small toy or then this is just me really wanting a fuzzy moment one day he finds a picture of this red-headed girl like when she was like 10 years old and on the back it just says lily evans year so and so mm -hmm. and it's just a picture he keeps hitting me and he knows it's his aunt because it's aunt's, aunt's writing yeah mm -hmm. that's all i want Criticize says, I mean, he encourages Dudley to hit Harry too, and you're not wrong. Uh, we actually mm -hmm. come up with that in the next chapter, which is something that I want to chat here with you. Uh, for Actually, you know what? We'll chat about that on break. Um, 
yeah. Uh, do we have anything we want to wrap up this chapter with? Any final the thoughts? Are, the Dursleys are just shit people, as the book is written. Vernon's a shit person because he he goes as far as to wait until P Piers is out of the building because at least mm -hmm. they know not to abuse Harry in front of people. Mm -hmm. But like I said, all I want is silent ally Petunia, yeah. which leans back into that whole fan fiction. I want it to be finished, but it's <laughs> a... <laughs> I know. So, I think. <laughs> I think this really rounds out and wraps up chapter two really nicely. I, I like where we've come with this. Um, we're going to take a bit of a break here, guys. Um, actually, <laughs> we're going to take a bit of a break, kind of a five, ten minute break. Um, one second. You okay there, uh, Reading Dragon? Oh, yeah, my boyfriend's up. Okay. Um, Time to go back to sleep. <laughs> Uh, we're going to take a quick five, ten minute break. Uh, we are going to get up, stretch, refill our drinks if we need, refill our snacks, um, whatever you guys need. And we're going to have a chat while the three of us are going to have a quick chat while we're on break. For those of you that are uh, l watching here live on Twitch, please stick around. We will be back. For those of you that are in the podcast, unfortunately, this wraps up this episode for you guys. And we will see you in our next episode. Uh, if you would like to get in touch with us, we have our socials. So you can find Lady Punnett slash Thornwick on TikTok at paulina.avalon. You can find myself at linktree slash blazewing2010. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash blazewing2010. You can find The Reading Dragon at linktree slash The Reading Dragon. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash The Reading Dragon. And you can find our Idiot Book Nook podcast at anchor.fm slash Idiot Book Nook. You can also find the Crimson Entertainment channel on YouTube. You should just be able to search Crimson Entertainment on YouTube and it'll come up with like, kind of like the red circle and the lightning bolt. It'll say Crimson Entertainment Studios on it, all that jazz. Uh, but for episode two of the Idiot Book Nook brings you Harry Potter, uh, I'm Blazewing. And I'm The Reading Dragon. I'm Lady Punnett. And we want to thank you for joining us and we will see you next episode.